This is the sailing well and water for November 29. Emirates Team New Zealand AC75 is out testing. The 2019 Rolex Sydney to Hobart Yacht Race was launched at the Cruising Yacht Club of Australia. Gitana 17, Edmund de Rothschild in the Brest Atlantics. The Melges IC37 fleet are out for the Fall Cup. The RORC Transatlantic Race started from England. And the Ocean Racing Club of Victoria had their unusual Latitude Race. Now over to Auckland and the America's Cup defenders, Emirates Team New Zealand, are out testing. Good morning all, and welcome to the 2019 Rolex Sydney Hobart Yacht Race media launch. Celebrating the historic 75th staging of the world famous Blue Water Classic. Organised by the Cruising Yacht Club of Australia in partnership with destination partner, the Royal Yacht Club of Tasmania, the Rolex Sydney Hobart is firmly entrenched alongside the great yacht racing classics and indeed sporting events worldwide. So ladies and gentlemen, I'd now like to introduce the Commodore of the Cruising Yacht Club of Australia, Paul Milligan, to extend a club welcome and also acknowledge the significance of this year's race. Paul. Thank you, Gordon. Welcome everybody today to the media launch of the 75th Royal Sydney Hobart Yacht Race. I think the pictures at the end there really demonstrate what this is about for so many people who will be making their way south. On Boxing Day, yes, it's about the glory, but also about the fellowship, the community, and the friendship they forged before, during, and after the race. 
And that really is what we're celebrating this year in the 75th year. Uh, it's all about recognising the stories of the past, but also you know, the future and the innovation behind a lot of these racing boats. It's great to have uh, Bill, Jim, Sean and uh, Ian here with us today to talk about you know, their own particular campaigns. And I think the diversity in their boats and their interests and their background you know, really does represent uh, the fleet. The race is, is a special event. It's certainly one of the most famous races in, in the world. To be a part of the 75th is, is particularly exciting. Um, and especially alongside boats like uh, Bill 32 footer here, it just shows you the diversity of the fleet, the interest in the race and the spirit of the people that are campaigning. It, it, it makes the whole thing much more of a, a personal event than just a yacht race. And the unpredictability. Uh, certainly, the, <laughs> certainly the unpredictability. I think it's, uh, it's one of those races that uh, you, there is no prevailing weather pattern other than you know it's going to change. <laughs> if you can look back at this race, and I spoke to Roger Batten about this last year, do you feel that the weather conditions are changing and how does that affect your uh, approach to the race? You must be having the same conversations I've been having with Roger. When, uh, about 12 months ago, we delivered our trimaran up to the Philippines and sailed through two typhoons. And I said to Roger at the time, I think we've got to relook really at the global modelling because nothing seems to line up anymore. And that, which is incredibly difficult for the weather routers um, because there are a lot of, lot of uh, variables now. So hence, um, you know, we don't have anyone uh, like TP52 sitting in this panel this year, but generally we'll be looking at the TP52s of so the boats that are the best all-round performers for a race such as the Hobart race. So there is more opportunity now because the weather's a lot, lot <coughs> different. So, uh, you know, certainly that's been our thinking um, to the approach to this race. Uh, you know, we've got both ends of the spectrum of the, the super maxis on both ends of the table here that have both got their strengths and weaknesses. So in our area, to attempt to win the Tattersalls, we're trying to take all those vagaries out by having something with variable displacement that does something a bit different. So I think you need to look at the weather holistically, but you also need to be able to remod your boat for the conditions. Uh, Ian, how much pressure for your Wild Oaks crew in line of recent events to make this a 10th week of Uh Look, <coughs> I feel we're just out there to race now, and uh, whether it's nine or 10 or whatever, you know, it's, I think for us, is we really um, enjoy racing this boat and, and we enjoy the competition amongst, you know, the, all the boats in the Sydney to Hobart race. Um, we've had some great experiences and everything. So for us, it's, you know, it's, it's why the boat exists and, and everything around the rest of the year's sailing activities is works back from the Sydney to Hobart race. So, but the opportunity to sail these boats um, is, is rare when we were growing up. You know, these boats didn't exist. And as Sean, uh, Sean was saying, you know, the, the big change in this race is the speed of this race, you know, just over one day now. Whereas, you know, when we started and, and the little boats, you know, we used to take six, seven days getting in there before New Year's Eve. So, you know, the, the weather window we actually experience is much, much shorter. Um, so, but look, these are just wonderful boats to sail. You know, they may be the last time we sail these boats, you know, the, the um, sort of technical aspect of sailing is changing. And as you know, I'm sort of quite involved in all the foiling stuff. And, you know, it's probably only a matter of time before, you know, old blokes like me don't want to be on things doing 40 knots on foils. <laughs> so, you know, I'll, I'll, so I'll, I'll make the most of, uh, 75th. Um, just some of the elite crew that you have on board this year. You can only dream of 40 knots, but you did 18 knots recently, I believe. Yes, we did. Um, Kendall, Michael, Michael Spears. Uh, 43 Hobarts. Yeah, 43 Hobarts he's done. The Rob Case. Top, Rob Case. Then the top four of the crew, I think there's 83 Hobart races between them. So. And Olympic sailor Scott Kaufman. That's right. Um, yes, joined Scotty. as well, so it's a pretty hot crew. Yes, I went to school with Scotty, and uh, uh, so did uh, Rob Munro. Yeah. Narrabeen Boys High School. Yeah, yes. yeah. That's good. Good state high school. Uh, Narrabeen Boys High. <laughs> <laughs> You've done very well for a way with boy. <laughs>
Voilà mon œuvre. Je suis assez fier. C'est vrai que des fois je me demande pourquoi aller les coups techniques parce que c'est vrai que euh, je peux tout faire moi-même. Hein. C'est propre, c'est bien fait. C'est pas compliqué, un peu de Sika et puis euh, du Gretep et tu répares tout. Dans les 25 à bosser sur le bateau, moi quand j'avais mon Figaro, j'étais tout seul et je faisais tout moi-même. Hein. Bon, c'est fier de moi. C'est pourquoi t'as réparé ça bah, C'était pour. Euh, je me demande pourquoi. C'est pour l'aéro. Parce qu'il y avait un trou de, de 10 cm carré là et un bah, massif il revenait fort. Quoi. Depuis que j'ai bouché le trou là, un bah, massif il s'éloigne. C'est hallucinant. Maintenant je vais aller faire le boulot de Nico et Cyril. Je vais aller réparer les moteurs électriques. Et après je ferai un peu les foils. J'ai pas l'impression que ça me gêne. Toi t'as l'impression que ça me gêne. Ça me gêne. Je crois pas. Hein. Ah Un autre monde commence. Il paraît que sur le vent des gobes, il y a des mecs qui mettent dans les papiers journal les oranges et les pamplemousses, ça se conserve jusqu'à la fin quasiment. On va avoir des fruits frais 18 jours après le départ, c'est quand même pas mal. Donc euh, ouais c'est top. On n'est pas allé sur la plage les prendre mais on n'était pas loin quand même. Hier. J'aurais pu. un record à dompter. Je me sens prêt, envie d'y aller. Je ne pense pas que beaucoup de gens ont la chance de le faire et je pense que nous avons définitivement le bateau pour briser le record. On a encore envie d'y retourner et d'essayer de le battre. Je pense que c'est définitivement le temps. C'est notre temps. Donc partir pour un tour du monde, c'est une grande chose, c'est quelque chose de très dur. Beaucoup d'engagement pour tout le monde, pour toute l'équipe. Spin Drift, c'est un bateau qui fait 40 mètres. Uh, I think it's the best boat at the moment to do this with. Et maintenant, on a envie d'aller quitter la ligne et voilà, de faire avancer au mieux Spin Drift 2 pour tenter de, de battre ce fabuleux record. On est 12 personnes à bord. Plutôt de bon caractère, donc euh, non, non, ça se passe plutôt bien. On part de Ouessant, large de Ouessant, on fait le tour de l'Antarctique et, et on revient à Ouessant, donc c'est un record assez fantastique. Pas le droit de s'arrêter, pas le droit de faire d'escale, donc il faut vraiment que le bateau soit prêt euh, avant le départ à la perfection et que tout se passe bien sur le parcours. Maintenant, le record à battre, il est très difficile, hein, c'est un peu moins de 41 jours. Euh, autour de la planète, en tout cas l'équipage est prêt, euh, le bateau est prêt et, et maintenant on va attendre la, la bonne fenêtre météo pour pouvoir se lancer euh, au départ de Wesson.
Fort Lauderdale Winter Series, event number one for the IC37 class. This is a great place to sail. Lots of places to stay, places to eat, and you just go out there on the cut and boom, you're you're right on the race course basically. So it's easy in, easy out. Oh, we're down here to enjoy the Florida weather, have a great regatta, get out with some friends and have some competitive sailing. I think there'll be a lot of camaraderie down here and a lot of sharing of ideas. So it's it'll be a good warm up, good good time in the boat. It's it's great to sail in big waves and win when we get them. It's fun anytime you get to race against other boats and these are some of the best sailors in the world. To be able to race with them here in Fort Lauderdale is perfect venue, perfect boat, perfect group. I think my favorite part about this boat, for me, it's faster than most boats I've been on. Something that I haven't had a whole lot of experience with, so it's nice to really have like serious one design racing. I like the new energy into the class. Our crew is pretty diverse. It's a pretty younger crew, and it's a mix of people who work in construction or work in trade. Uh, we've got a marketing person, we've got a lawyer for tactician. Oh, and frankly, we're guys. just out there learning every day. It's great. The size of the boat is appealing to me. It seemed like a great design and, you know, the Yacht Club bought 20 of them, so all of a sudden you've got a pretty good one design class. That certainly was the appeal, the cost, you know, the idea of just having an amateur crew. Lots of fun, but we'll see. The boat sails really well. It's pretty lively and responsive. It turns really well. It's a fun boat to drive. The boat's pretty simple. The deck layout is really easy. And once you understand the basic systems, a wide range of people can sail this boat, but it's hard to sail the boat well. That's the way it should be. The Corinthian side of it is absolutely what drew me to this platform. First of all, it's a great platform, it's a pretty cool boat, sporty, fun, right, it's all clean and everything. The Corinthian side of it is what needs to be rejuvenated, it needs to be brought back into the sport. So it's, it's just awesome being out here with, with all these guys that I actually like grew up sailing with. Well, you folks who are up there in the cold weather, not down here enjoying uh, this competitive nature, I, I encourage you to get down here as soon as you can. There's two more regattas coming this, this winter. So we're with uh, Yerin Hobson, uh, the skipper of the Wally 100 Dark Shadow, and just over 24 hours to start the race, Yerin, and I'm sure a lot of the eyes are going on the weather. What are you seeing for Dark Shadow? Well, unfortunately, in contrary to last time, it, it seems to be quite light. So maybe a little bit of acceleration with the heat during start time, and then by the time we get through the pass, we're looking at acceleration between the islands and lighter breeze model showing between eight and 12 knots as a, as a sort of guideline. Um, changing a lot every time we look at a model over the last two days. So by the end of today, I think we'll have a more accurate view on how we sit for the first couple of days. With the models as they are today, north is a big mistake. So uh, we'll be heading south unless something dr drastically changes. Okay, south's a more traditional route. North has come in over the years. Why is north a big mistake for, in your opinion? With the weather model, as it says, it's all about weather with this race. Um, last time we raced against Narita, we came second across the line. They went north and it paid off in a big way. Um, so we've seen it go the wrong way and uh, for us. And this time we'll try not to make the same mistake. So, uh, you know, but it's up to the weather. Okay. We really should change the name. It'd be easier. Why? What's wrong with the name? Everybody puts, puts an R in it, or a Jaganda, or... Oh, really? So, why did you call the boat Jangada, Richard? The, well, the, the origin of the Jangada is Portuguese for a raft. And on the coast of Brazil, Recife, on the reefs, they have these very shallow um, uh, balsa rafts with a single sail on it. And as a teenager, my first dinghy was a laser, which reminded us of the Jangadas. And the name has stuck. We're about 24 hours away from the start of the Rourke transatlantic race and uh, you see you've been provisioning up the boat um, I'm guessing you're going to try and have a bit of time off today but you must have been looking at the weather so uh, let's start with you Richard um, what does the weather look like for Jangada for the Rourke transatlantic race? Yes well, well the weather at the moment is a high pressure sitting over Madeira um, and we're looking for the first week that high pressure is going to move south 
uh, so we're expecting some quite light winds. So the decision is whether to go north, get above the high pressure, um, pick up the lows and the winds that come with that, or whether we traditionally dive south to Cape Verde until the butter melts and, and turn right. Um, so I think those strategically are the two main options. Um, the middle route, I think the, that high pressure and light winds will just be too slow, so we've got to go left or right. And come on, Richard, I'm going to I'm going to ask you: Is it going to be north? It's going to be a much more comfortable ride going south. So you're nodding a lot with south at the moment, are you? I, think it's, uh... I, I, you know, I like the north route. I want to be bashing into 20, 30 knots of breeze. You know, anything to win the race, really. Um, so you know, we've been discussing that as we go forward. At some stage, you're going to have to commit, aren't you? Um... The, the decision for us really is though we've got to go uh, north of Tenerife, so the racetrack sends us uh, over the top of the Canary Islands. Um, so by then we will be another 24 hours into the weather forecasts, um, and that will help. I think you know by then we'll have made our decision. But that's our final. You know we'll have some options. We will look at options. You know what if, and then when when we've got that final high res. Um, weather forecast off Tenerife before we disappear into the realms of Iridium, sat phone and small file downloads um, and then we'll, we'll probably make the decision there as to whether to go, or, well that is the point at which you have to decide whether you're going left or right. Okay, a, t a cup of tea in the, in the cockpit talking about this in 24 hours? Oh, I'm sure, well it sounds like quite a major headland that actually. <laughs> Very well put. Very well put. <laughs> well, you know, the, the, the beauty of this race is that people could watch it unfold on the uh, YB tracker. So about 24 hours in the race, I'm going to be looking to see what, what you do. And uh, maybe you can tell us as well, because you'll probably still just about have self connection yes. at Tenerife. Yes. Yeah, sure. So would you mind telling us? We will, yes. You will, okay, <laughs> brilliant. We'll look forward to that. Hi, I'm Neville Rose, one of the OICV's race management team members for the 2019 Latitude Ocean Race with a quick race update for you. It's going to be a very tight finish in this year's race. All boats have turned at their designated latitudes within about half an hour of each other, so they're all heading back to Port Phillip Heads at the moment, and so we're expecting a very tight finish off Portsy Pier. For those that don't know, the Latitude Ocean Race gets its name from the unique nature of the course. We actually send the boats from Queenscliff out of Port Phillip Heads down south to a designated latitude that is based on their handicap. So each boat goes to a different latitude. The bigger boats sail further south than the smaller boats. And the idea being that if we get it right and the handicaps are right and they all sail to their handicaps, they'll all finish at around the same time. So unlike any other ocean races where the bigger boats finish first, in the latitude ocean race, all the yachts finish around the same sort of time. And this is no exception. It does look though that True Colours and Rosinanti 2 are leading the fleet on the way back to the head, so they're expecting to be back inside the heads first. And also on the water this year, we have participants from the ORCV's Beyond the Bay program, who after seven months of coursework, uh, have taken the first step into Bass Strait and sailing in the ocean, so congratulations to them. Some of those boats also have mentors on board, which is fantastic. We're blessed in this sport to have mentors who are quite happy to give up their time they're all experienced ocean sailors and and helping those newbies that are out there for the first time which is which is great the fleet's enjoying beautiful conditions this afternoon they're certainly heading back to port phillip heads a few knots faster than what they headed to their designated latitude they've got westerly winds of 15 to 20 knots so the winds after the beam they're enjoying fast running conditions and giddy up as we would normally say as well and we're looking forward to seeing them finish at around 5.30, 6 o'clock, maybe 6.30 later this afternoon. Thanks.